This is Geeks Represent, where we talk about representation and issues that matter to us geeks. We are Daryl, Marshall, Sean, and myself, Joe. Diversity of cultures is one of the things that makes America truly beautiful. Depending on where you are, you're able to immerse yourself into your neighbor's cultural identity while also sharing your own. This leads to greater empathy and understanding between people whose ancestors may have lived oceans apart. But when does appreciation turn into appropriation? So geeks, what is your definition of cultural appropriation? Similar to like plagiarism, it's like profiting or benefiting from a cultural element without giving due credit or acknowledging the struggles of that culture. Yeah, I agree with that. Same. There can be a bit of a fine line, though, because some people can say that they're borrowing from a culture and just like acknowledge it and elevate it. Well, I shouldn't say elevate the culture, but like make it more visible to more people. And other people can also take the same thing and ignore its roots and not, well, pretend like it's their own original idea. Do not Ooh. steal. Mm -hmm. and balancing that with like the intent of the person like doing it is where a lot of difficulties lie Mm. yeah Yeah. no i no you you definitely see that a lot especially when it comes to like you know for food for example right you know how many youtubers go out there and like talk about oh like here's this thing called pho and just as, as, as a vietnamese person i get peeved by that a little bit when they present it as like a new thing, or like this is how I make it, or whatever, and you, you know they're doing it for the views, and you know they're doing it for whatever, and not it's just really off putting. Versus like you know maybe going to like a local pho restaurant and like saying, "If you guys want to get some good authentic Vietnamese pho, come on down to this restaurant on like you know James Street or whatever." There's a bunch of restaurants out here, which I feel would be appreciation and not appropriation. Also, side note, I love pho. So, <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't, man? Yeah, especially when you're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but I definitely love some good pho. On I know Sunday all afternoon. about that. That's what. That's all <laughs> I did drunk. at VCU. <laughs> Whenever I visited VCU, Sunday after, we always visited the pho place. Pho so one. Pho so one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I have to agree with uh, Daryl in that um, there is that nuance aspect of are you like acknowledging or or I mean are you like paying respect back to it or are you elevating the um, cultural element? But even in the aspect of elevating, if you do it without the credit, then that ends up becoming appropriation too, because I definitely see that a lot with dance, um, especially the Asian choreo hip-hop community will where they will feel like they have elevated the dance like they raise choreography to the next level but they don't they don't bring it they don't bring it back or tie it back to where they got the moves from oftentimes so i would say even with elevation if you don't tie back the community that it was originally based off of or like even incorporate or give credit to um i think that's definitely a case of cultural appropriation you definitely see this in like k-pop by the way too like extending what you're saying like asian dancers not just asian american dancers but you know k-pop is definitely guilty of this you could not just oh, the yeah, dancing but the music yeah you could t- you know that you know where these influences are you know they didn't originate some of these sounds yeah um and yet they have such like yeah you, you read a lot about like stories of black people visiting or living in Korea and South Korea and getting so much like animosity. And yet they're listening to like this music in the clubs or whatever, not thinking about where it came from. So yeah. Could you go more into that? Cause I haven't really heard anything on those lines. Um, for example, uh, or the, the the animosity, the animosity part, or you can just send me an article and we can link it in the show notes. We could put an article, but like, like one of Jashel's friends, she's a teacher in uh, South Korea right now. And she is a Latina and already with their, I guess you could blame like the societal norms regarding like beauty, you know, very like Mm. superficial, like, attitudes towards beauty and 
all that already date like dating for her was very difficult and then there's there's a, there's plenty of youtubers right i've been following a few uh like interracial couple youtubers yeah that's my bias showing but um <laughs> it's usually from a point of view of, like korean men and black women pairings and like the the racism that black women get over there is see the, the difference between like racism over there here most of the time is that Oh, in South Korea, it's not like violent, right? It's not in, out of a sense of like, oh, you're inferior, but they just have like very like, you know, bad ideas or very ignorant ideas of black people. Yeah. And colorism is like really, really big in Asia, mm-hmm. um, even mm-hmm. amongst Asians themselves. Um, the, the darker skinned you are, the more looked down upon usually you are. I know in mm-hmm. China for sure. Um, they think you're just like a farmer, someone who works outside, because that's why you're so tan. But yeah, Korea, where beauty standards are so like, like kind of like in the spotlight all the time, I think that's a lot of where they get their, I guess, as Joe would say, animosity from. And just their lack of like, I guess, encountering black people. Because I know when I went to Korea with uh, my, my, my friend Mitchell, Every time, everywhere he went somewhere, people were asking to take pictures with him because they'd never seen a black person before. And it was just this, they, they just didn't know how to deal with it or even how to even handle anything of it. Isn't that what exotification is? Yeah. Uh, they yeah. kind of like fetishized him, didn't they? Yeah. About even really understanding what that means. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, like, did, did y'all remember, like, there was a, there was a laundry commercial, like, for a laundry detergent? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> we'll post it, but they stuck, oh, like, a black dude in a washing, yeah, they stuck a black dude in a washing machine, and he came out Asian. Yeah. <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> I look at Marshall's like, face, and he's like, what? And I'm like, wait, hold up now. Him, we, don't he don't bother looking for it. Lighter we'll skinned. Yeah. What is that? I was like, whoa, that's fucked up. Oh, China. You not- oh, this is back in 2016. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it was a remake of a European commercial as well. I can't remember if that commercial oh was my that God. bad. Or- <laughs> she shoved his whole head in there. His whole body. Yeah, no wonder it got pulled. Title of this episode: She shoved his whole head. In. <laughs> it's just like, oh my goodness! <laughs> and he's painting. Yeah. So, I bet they didn't even think about that. But where, where are the implications of that, right? But yeah, it's pretty bad. For more recent event, does does anyone remember what BTS did? We're probably gonna get hate. <laughs> like oh, no. if I talk about this, because there's a lot of BTS fans out there, but. What do they remember? Been, leave them out of the hashtags for this one. <laughs> will not be in the hashtags. So they did. They did a photo shoot recently at a Holocaust museum in Germany, mm. dressed up in like Nazi apparel. And so I don't bizarre. understand how they haven't gotten canceled for that yet, or gotten like vilified yet. Like I know, I I know we talked about cancel culture before. I like I no, I don't really approve of it, but at the same time, like. How did they get away with being so ignorant? And they claim ignorance. They said, oh, we didn't really understand like the full gravity of like what they were doing. And I'm like, and I, I can understand that. I'm assuming like their views of like World War II are probably more like Asian centric because, you know, it, that was what affected them the most. And I get that. But this is like some bare bones basics, man, like some history lessons. Did y'all just like not go to school? You're at the place where it happened, or they're talking about where it happened. I'm yeah. not sure where exactly where they went. And they're at a Holocaust museum. You think yeah. someone would have told them? Yeah, the language there, barrier, though, there. too. Still, still. still. We can go to a coffee shop that's, for real. That, or oh, yeah, that's a coffee shop. Look at this. Yeah. We're cool. Mm. But that's. I feel like that's. I feel like that's a clear cut cultural appropriation where you take something. You take an aspect or historical or cultural aspect and use it without like any um, knowledge of the history of it. Right. That's key. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Not that I'm accusing anything, but I I wonder how many BTS fans there are who don't give a damn about Asian hate. Mm. 
Because that's that, that was another. I think that's something we talked about with cultural appropriation too. Was like being pro- either profiting or benefiting or experiencing, like you know, this a people's culture, but not either not doing anything about or the not struggles. caring about about their struggles. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah how how are, how are those like how are fans of like anime and K-pop who don't care about what's going on with like Asian, uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. How are they any different from say, you know, the um, sports teams owners who don't give a damn about what black people are going through right now. Mm-hmm. With police brutality. Who just want to like, sure. who are, or like other sports fans who just like, Hey, shut up and play. Yeah. You know, the amount of money they make, but that's about it. That is the difference. <laughs> yes. They need that money to get their wives extra airbags. Okay. Oh, God. What? <laughs> oh, you know what I said. Okay. Extra airbags? Oh! Ha, there it is. Ha, ha, oh. Ha. oh. Dude, I, <laughs> I was like, are their wives really bad drivers? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's called subtlety. <laughs> In between the reefs. <laughs> I mean, they buy a lot of cards. That's all. We're keeping all of this. I'm going to throw a sponge at you. (laughs) Whatever, man. Who calls them airbags? Someone who's trying to be subtle. I'm going to say the other words that I could say. I guess. Whatever. (laughs) But, yeah. 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 Mm. There's definitely a... (laughs) Going back to the topic, but it is a fine line because... Like, look at what happened to, like, Jeremy Lin, right? Does anyone remember when he got those, um, I think he got corn rolls, right? Yeah. Yeah. I believe so, yeah. And it's funny because there's also a, kind of a lack of self-awareness, too. Because when he when he did his corn rolls, one, and this is from his perspective. So who knows if, you know, he, he said this to make himself look better. But I'm choosing to believe him. He... Um, he said that, you know, he talked to his black teammates about it. He tried to learn everything about it first and about how to do it properly. And he asked, like, you know, not to say, like, certain black people can speak for all black people because I know, like, everyone different. But at least he talked to the to his teammates and the people he knew, right, to make sure that it was okay with them. Which I, and so, but, and he did it. And other other uh, black players were calling him like racist for like appropriating it or whatever. But the thing about that was his, his, uh, his comeback when he was like, Hey, I really dig your, your Chinese tattoos. Right. Yeah. Like the very player who was like accusing a race of cultural appropriation showed very zero self-awareness. Didn't he? I'd say so. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like, uh, I was just, is this is this crap like that? It just makes me think like I don't know. Don't in, in cases like that, why stir the pot, right? In what way? Um Are talking about why get the cornrows or why comment on them? Why comment on them like that with like okay. such like mm. hostility? You know? When you or yourself are guilty of it, like personally. I mean it's a touchy subject and I, I can see why like Jeremy might be in the gray zone where some people might say be think it's problematic. Cause like you said, when he asks his teammates, they don't all speak for the entire black community. Just mm-hmm. like when you might have some friends that might allow you to say the N word, but try it. <laughs> like it's true in a public setting. <laughs> yeah, like like yeah, it's That's tricky. definitely true. But I guess I, I guess the missing part is that unless you know like that unless you are aware that he did the research or you know like actually did it with like respect if, uh, basically if you if you don't know him as like a person yeah or as an individual then I and guess you, 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 you fall into your like your worst assumptions yeah and it's tricky when it's like that's the first thing you see before you can even explain it or something so like yeah. But I would say in terms of gray areas, Jeremy, at least his reasoning is it would put him more in the appreciation or closer to appreciation zone than, say, just the Chinese tattoos for the sake of Chinese tattoos. Which the guy met a lot of people do for their first tattoos, right? 
or like this True. this means like serenity and it's like no that means wonton soup so. <laughs> number 43 <laughs> i thought it meant courage and strength no it's a 43 <laughs> um, well damn yeah and from the play devil's advocate a little bit when you see a lot of people disrespecting or appropriating your culture and you people kind of jump to that conclusion that someone else is doing it without and you can't know the person's heart or the no. person's research or reasoning behind it but you yeah, said people jump to that assumption that's true i would say he bold for that I guess, yeah <laughs> i think bold so for what, bringing it up no i mean i think he's bold for trying it out i mean yeah he's definitely yeah. brave well, it's good that like someone with him has enough clout to like so that he's able to explain himself. But I do mm-hmm. remember like this other case where like this this like interracial couple. I think it was a it was a it was a black girl and an Asian boy. And I say that because I think they were in high school at the time. I think they were dressed in each other's like 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 he was wearing a dashiki. And she was wearing like a, I forgot what it's called in Chinese. It's like that, that dress. The Chi Pao? Or like, I think so. And they posted on Instagram and, you know, it was just, you know, it's, it's an Instagram post about like these two, two teenagers who are in love, right? And so they got like harassed so badly, right? Like people saying like, you know, you're not, you're not Asian. You can't wear that. Or like, why is this Asian kid wearing wearing that and just like I, I, again like daryl was saying i guess maybe maybe, maybe people are too jaded mm-hmm. or they do assume like the worst and on guilty on their part they're they're not or people are not like diving deeper into the story they're just reacting off their you know they see it they feel this way they're going to talk about it or they're going to say this and that might be reality but it still sucks <laughs> yeah that's also the internet and why it can be a toxic place to be. Yeah. To learn about more about toxicity on the internet, <laughs> you are past episodes. That will also be in the show notes. Yes. It's going to be a, yeah. it's going to be a thick one. This week. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why I'm glad Jeremy did have enough clout to also explain as well. Cause then it does shine light on the whole double standardness of it. And like, bring awareness to because to people who aren't even aware of their what they even do so mm-hmm. yeah yeah kind of steering off but what do y'all think of black fishing Has that heard of it? <laughs> Never heard of it. i was just gonna say who wants to talk about king kardashian but <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh, <laughs> that same nice. wavelength oh. so for those who don't know well <laughs> How how do how, how do you define it? There, how would you put it? Black fishing, um, going for predominantly for wealthy African American men. No, that is no, not what black fishing is. Not in this case. It's more not like, not literally fishing for black people, Marshall. Uh, <laughs> that's why I don't know what it is. I've never been caught. Fish, less fishing for and more like catfishing. Like, like appearing as if and benefiting from black culture, even though you're not that um, ethnicity. Oh, like Stacey Dash. Stacey Dash is uh, black, though. Yeah. Oh. It's more <laughs> like um, Rachel Dolezal or yeah. um, Bod Barbie, which I'm mad I know that name. Uh, blame Doctor. Oh, Phil. the Catch Me Outside girl. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, oh, hell, Ariana Grande. Right. Yeah, I guess that's um, Latina fishing, Latinx fishing, maybe. Is there any? I can't think of any um, male black fishers at the moment. I used to think because there was rumors going around that Sean King, the you know the activist, that he was not actually black, but. You know, then I think he posted like a picture of himself when he was a kid. Like, yeah, he clearly is. So, <laughs> because they were um, sending pictures of his half brother who was uh, white, but they had the um, same mom or dad or something. I forget. Yeah. So, but they were yeah. accusing him of like, you know, being so involved in like, you know, Black Lives Matter and, and not, like 
but, profiting but no. off of it, even though he didn't take any money even, from it. But and nope, y'all were wrong. So shut the. F- okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, I can't. The only the only uh, examples I can think of are like he said, like Kim Kardashian, uh, the Cash Me Outside girl, Ariana Grande. I don't know if that's because it's like a fashion thing or like or a trend thing. Yeah, I think uh, it came out. At least it came to me. It was a. It was a. It was more apparent to me back when I believe that she, the Kim Kardashian, wore her hair in um, box braids, or mm-hmm. and because she is a trendsetter, um, people were just like, "Oh, this is a cool style that she made up." <laughs> mm-hmm. I think um, another Kardashian did something similar, and yeah, so just not her, not actually owning that but not really going any making any ways to dissuade people from believing that she's a that this is her original thing when mm-hmm. it's like millions of people's first exposure to that hairstyle yeah mm. that's Hell. appropriative so definitely would black fishing just be like cultural appropriation where you kind of act as the trendsetter like you started the trend or whatnot that like, or maybe, can you define it a bit more? Maybe, maybe less, maybe less like starting it, but more benefiting from it, right? Mm-hmm. Or benefiting mm-hmm. from, oh, because thing about, I know I'm, I'm still like kind of mansplaining. I don't, I don't know what the racial version of mansplaining yeah. is, <laughs> but race-plaining. 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 but as I hear it, it's, I mean, there, I mean, I could probably speak better to this than I can, but for example, black hairstyles have been vilified in American mm-hmm. society, mm-hmm. like professionally, like, you know, there's some schools, you know, that don't allow their black students to have like certain hairstyles. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of a sudden you see like Kim Kardashian and in turn, because of her, a lot of other people doing the same trends and it's seen as fashionable and trendy. Mm. And, People okay. can argue like, oh, like people, oh, oh, like they're making it more acceptable. And it's like that shouldn't have been the reason why it's more acceptable because white people are doing it. Yeah, exactly. So, a guy version then would be Elvis. Yes, hmm. absolutely. Because yes. like, yeah. a- Rock wasn't acceptable until he made it, or just basically copied everyone and just presented mm-hmm. it to a white audience, and he sold mm-hmm. it because he was white. Mm-hmm. Yes, and then a lot of white bands grew because of that. Mm-hmm. If that's the case, I heard the Beatles have been accused of that sometimes, though they tend to be more on the side of respectful. But uh, Elvis for sure, I think Elvis for sure. Because I don't, I, I think you're right. I think the Beatles at, at least like gave tributes or or performed with like because didn't they and Jimi Hendrix tour together? At some point, so at the very least, because part part the big part of cultural appropriation, I think, is when you benefit and don't give back, or don't yeah. Like, but give I think there's the same opportunity. Like looking at their early history, like they did just straight covers. Like Elvis mm-hmm. did covers, and um, the Beatles did covers, and because they were more palatable, they were successful, and that's why I think they they would fit into this. But it sounds like black fishing is just like just cult- cultural appropriation for black culture, right? Like that would be a more simple definition mm-hmm. of it. Or making people, yeah, or adapting your lifestyle to make as if you are a black individual when without any of the struggles attached to it. Mm. Right? Okay. Or actually being. But it's interesting you brought the be because there's actually a great scene in one night in Miami where Sam, like the character where Sam cook portrayed by Leslie Odom jr. Is talking about that and how other he's gotten accusations from other black people for selling out. Mm. Right. But honestly, he makes the argument that you can't help, but agree with that. He sold like he sold songs that should, that he said, yeah, they should have been sung by, you know, black people but he had to make 
money where he could. And yeah, he could have like, he could have reserved it for a black, his, the songs that he wrote for like a black singer and still make money off of it. But instead he chose to give it to like the Beatles. And now he, at, at the time, I think he was one of the wealthiest black people in America at the time. Mm-hmm. So, and because of that, he was in a, he was in a position to elevate other black people. So it's like kind of like 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 choose a lesser of two evils, I guess. Mm. In that case, still sucks. Still sucks. Like you know, people have to have, make those choices in the first place. But you know, like he's trying to do it to really. get it onto a more elevated platform, like more widespread, yeah, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And hopefully, mm-hmm. comes back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess compromising have, compromises having to be made, mm-hmm. uh, especially at the time. Yeah, compromises compromises are being made now, right? But that was weird. Rachel Dolezal, though, why did she do that? <laughs> did she have a good reason? Did she have I a can't reason? Recall. Yeah, uh, I I can't speak authoritatively, so I don't want to say it. Yeah, although I, 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 we maybe shouldn't just list examples, but. Mm-hmm. Um, like Martina Big, and please feel free to cut this out because it's kind of a lot. Um, Go ahead. Let me share a picture. This is probably way too much and not totally, not totally work safe. So I'll just we can choose to put it in or take it out. Um, yeah. I'll put it in the chat and um, sorry. Put it in the references. We'll keep it in the references, but put an NSFW tag on it. Yeah. Sorry for your eyes. Oh, God. I'm scared. You can look at her Twitter. Um, her Twitter. Oh, already for the thumbnail. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That yes. explains it all. She what? identifies as a black woman. I've heard of this woman. Oh Jesus! Let me guess. She went on her like and twenty three and me found out she's like what one percent African American. <laughs> like whoa, Vicky. She has been taking melanin injections. Oh my Jesus! So Jesus. Granted, Damn. one of the things it's like with black fishing it's like if you could, you could not be black if you wanted to. And that's kind mm-hmm. of the that's kind of a sticking point. You can mm-hmm. you can back away. You can not deal with the oppression. You can not deal with all the stuff that we have to deal with. <laughs> yeah, but mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, she's taking it a way too far. <laughs> I, My question is, why does she associate being black with having big fake beach balls? I think. Those came first. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Them previously they came first. Okay. That's uh, just, I don't know. That's yeah. very interesting. I think it's more being addicted to plastic surgery and there's a, there's a guy like that. I forgot his name, but I think there was this like he was a blonde haired blue eyed dude, and he took he did surgery to make himself look Korean. Hmm. You want to look that's K-pop, name, but that's what. Yeah, probably because yeah, yeah. It's just really off-putting because it it literally looks like a mask, right? <laughs> yeah. So, it's just interesting. I, I it'd be interesting to see if like there's actually like psychological studies, like, but I don't know if it's common enough to warrant like a big enough set, sample size, you know, for black fishing or for just yeah. Or surgery. as as Martina Big put it, transracialism is that how she put it. Yeah, that might be Rachel Dolezal as well, but I can't say for sure. Yeah, what it tells me is like you, and this sounds probably very accusatory, but I'm like, it sounds like y'all didn't have enough struggles in your life, and so you decided to take on this. <laughs> Yeah, take on or, the struggle. Yeah, I don't know. Literally idolizing or fantasizing aspects of 
another race. It is fetishizing. Yeah. It it's definitely like fetishizing. Internalized fetishizing. <laughs> it's odd. So, yeah. Way the list much. can go on and on. If, as listeners, if you have any other examples, go feel free to add that to the comments. Now, would you consider Eastern influence on Western geek culture and the other way around as a Western um, culture on like Eastern, like, Asian media, for example, appropriation or appreciation? Depends on how they do it. Yeah, I guess that's the simplest <laughs> answer, right? We were, we were talking about um, earlier about Samurai Champloo and Cowboy Bebop a little bit, right? Marshall mm-hmm. and Sean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I heard that um, some, some people considered like Cowboy Bebop as like an anime that appropriated black culture because it took like all of its jazz influences, but it didn't have like a black main character. Um, I know in past episodes when we um, kind of touched appropriation lightly, I said that um, Cowboy Bebop was kind of appreciative in this aspect of how um, deep they went into jazz. But yeah, I know I hadn't thought about that. They didn't have a, a black main character, but then I know that you and uh, you, Daryl and Marshall, you you've said in the past that you would consider Jet Black as an ambiguously black character. So then, like, where would you would you say that maybe the show is more afraid of like breaking the standard and going like full appreciation, or like are they still in the middle ground of potentially appropriating, or like what were your thoughts on it? I mean, I'll be totally fair. I hadn't seen more than the first two episodes of Bebop until 2020. So I can't really. So I had that assumption way before I actually saw the, saw the show. Mm. Uh, that assumption he, that it was uh, appropriating. Oh, that he, he was a black character. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think it's a saw jet black. I just assume though. Well, they just weren't super creative with the names. But um, culturally, I guess paying homage and appropriating is that fine line. Mm-hmm. And so if they if um, they just said, oh, this is like a jazz or like a bebop show, then they only just have one track, of one style of, of the genre that might just be like oh that's our that's our thing that's our that's our um homage but we're just like a sci-fi cowboy show but they what what's her name yoko can yoko kano yoko kano yeah, yoko kano. um yeah she goes through a lot of different styles and a lot of different types of jazz both it's both reference in the episode names as well as just the soundtrack itself i took history of jazz back in college for a semester so i recognized nice. some things and um i appreciated the different musical styles and i feel like i haven't like looked at all the track names or anything like that but it's it feels more on the appreciation and paying homage side than appropriation just musically. And if I recall correctly, there was an episode or two on the blues, which was a little borderline for me. I, I didn't really focus on the blues that much that semester, so I can't really say for sure. <laughs> but I feel like that was more of a. Um, I think it was good. It could have been better, but it was good. Also, I haven't seen Samurai Champloo fully yet, so I can't say on that end. I was I was gonna mention because Samurai Champloo kind of repeats the same trend, except more leaning towards a uh, towards hip hop. Um, yeah. But the soundtrack was done by uh, how do you pronounce it? New Jabez. Yeah. Rest in peace, it. by the way. And you he's good. <laughs> right? So Daryl, from what I'm getting from you is that your your line between appropriation and appreciation is a level of effort. 
level level of effort and respect towards the uh, source, I guess. You can say that. Yeah. Because, like I said, Samurai Shampoo, I mean, there aren't any black people in Samurai Shampoo. The non, the, like the few non Japanese people were like the one Dutch dude, which was great for homosexual representation. <laughs> and um, also, uh, like, <laughs> When the American colonialists showed up and being like, these savages understand how to play baseball. <laughs> I was just like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> but um but even even though there's no no black characters at all, and given the story and the setting, it wouldn't really make sense for there to be any. You can tell like it's not they don't just play the same like musical rift over and over. They don't say they don't like it's all very well done music, so I guess they took it as an opportunity to have fun with the anachronisms, right? Like you have beatboxing, like samurai walking around, right? Yeah, um, which makes no sense, but it works. <laughs> so, yeah, and I almost um, feel like because of that anachronism, um, it's it's pretty clear that people know where like hip hop originated from, and um, so I, I feel like for Shampoo, at least, it's like clear enough where they're paying the homage. But with Bebop, it sounds like since it's like set in a sci-fi time and it's just like a space journey. But since the music for for you, Daryl, sounds like they did the amount of work um, that it was, it's leaning more towards uh, appreciation, basically. Yeah. The real folk blues is pretty bluesy, I'll say. Yeah, because it's like it's not as clear with jazz, like where it originated from, unless you like studied it or you know it. Because it because jazz is so long ago, it got like super whitewashed with smooth jazz and Kenny G <laughs> and all that <laughs> stuff afterwards. That like I feel like yeah, like unless you have a strong representation in the, in the show. It, I think that's probably maybe where people might have the issue with bebop because of that unclarity. While Shampoo, it's clear where hip hop comes from kind of thing. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, the clarity, was it there enough for you? I can see where you're saying, because um, I guess jazz does have its roots back in like, um, ragtime music and um, a big band as well. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so like as a result of the songs of that period, that's where you get um, bebop and eventually like hard bop. And then all those other styles that we now associate with jazz. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I can see your point with the murkiness and now jazz is not seen as solely a um it's more seen as like a american music style versus a african american music style yeah like internationally mm-hmm. but definitely more of the roots in black culture which you could say has been appropriated and remixed and mashed about um la la land i'm looking at you <laughs> <laughs> also um ska is seen as the offshoot of it so mm. for, for all of the uh real big fish fans out there <laughs> you can thank miles davis <laughs> oh no um yeah rave master intro my first big uh introduction to ska music mm-hmm. um i think i've lost the plot of what i was saying <laughs> <laughs> I guess um, not seeing how you've seen it uh, recently during 2020, would you consider it now? Because like probably back then we we're watching in the 90s, we wouldn't have thought of any of this because it's just it comes out like super early, and it, it, it at least for me, I, I wouldn't have been aware of um, cultural appropriation and that talk yet. It's like something that a lot of people talk about to this extent, at least where it's like. Where it's like um, upfront and everything I watch versus like, mm. like you know, like nowadays, like if I see it, it's like, oh shit, it's pretty clear. Other mm. than outside of my own personal uh, heritage, 
where I would have probably been uh, only aware in that subset, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I mean, as a whole, I think I know watching it, there's some things that are like, oh, this probably wouldn't fly in like if it came out now or it's just like I think it's a mushroom episode where they actually have a couple black characters that were the antagonists. Um, oh, is that the one with coffee? Or no? I maybe. Uh, I binge watched the show, so I can't. I can't say. Hmm. But there's a female assassin person, I think, and yeah, coffee. a guy that was selling the mushrooms that caused so much trouble. The episode. That's the only ones that really stood out. I'll say. Mm-hmm. Which, looking back at, it's not the greatest. <laughs> I'd have to rewatch uh, it. But. Yeah, maybe it's not as great as I thought. <laughs> it's it's still on the borderline, and that line is definitely obje- like subjective to the viewer. I'll say, and mm. for in every situation, though, right? That makes sense. It's hard because when did Cowboy Bebop come out? Like the like you like Sean said, it came out in like the nineties, nineteen ninety eight. Is that something that you can just write off as a product of its time? Because I know. Some people don't think that's a legitimate excuse. I don't think it's like should be an excuse per se, but at the same time, like how much, how mad can you get, you know, with yeah. a product so, with something so old? It also makes me curious what they're going to do with the reboot. True. Mm-hmm. Especially since it'll be very non ambiguous that Jet Black is black. <laughs> he is played by, what's that, Mustafa? Um, shit, what's his name? He was from Luke Cage. Shakir, was, I think. Mustafa Shakir? Mm-hmm. I think so. I believe so. Um, the one, he, um, Bushmaster. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So they have time to correct that then, to push it yeah. more on the appreciation side. So that's good. But um, back to like what you were saying about a product of its time, I guess it kind of reminds me of what we were talking about in our last episode um, about Legend of Korra, where they were kind of afraid to push the boundary of representation there just because like it was during a time where it wasn't as appreciated or accepted. I guess. That's true. Yeah, because they were the first. They were the first to have like a non-heterosexual relationship on screen with like the main characters. Yeah. So I guess that was the as far as they wanted to push the envelope as they could without you know pissing off the you know network overlords. Yeah, so I could see that. So I could see that with uh, Cowboy Bebop as well. Now, what do you think? Now, because Samurai Shampoo and Cowboy Bebop, the 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 points they get towards appreciation versus appropriation is due to their music. What about things like Bleach? Where it's like, because honestly, I haven't watched a lot of Bleach, but from what I can tell, there's a lot of like, like Latin influences, right? Mm-hmm. For those who've watched more of the series, would that be more appropriation? I mean, you know, the only thing Latin really is like the bad guys, the Espada and the, the Iron Car. But... Doesn't that kind of su- <laughs> wait? So you say only the bad guys are Latino? Are you saying that? <laughs> well, that's their name. They're named the Espada based off the number. Their numbers. Well, I think that's what Joe's trying to suggest. That, that <laughs> this might be problematic. Kind of, but, I mean, I'm speaking as again. I'm speaking as someone who doesn't really watch the series too much. I've only caught a few episodes here and there, so I'm literally asking, like, is that what they're doing? Because that seems problematic. That the Hollows live in. <laughs> well, yeah. In Hueco Mundo. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Hueco Mundo. They did have Chad. Who was of Latin descent? Who was like one of the the good guys who didn't know his powers? Came from Hueco Mundo, the bad place. I'm like, oh, that's what they called it. Yeah, they called it Hueco Mundo. It's like it soul society and Hueco Mundo's down there. I'm trying, Bleach. I'm trying really hard, but the more the more Marshall explains it, the more I'm like, what? I'm trying to be bluntly honest about it. <laughs> Um, 
So spoilers for the future next season of Bleach, whenever that comes out, and the end of the manga. Oh, he's half know. Mexican. Yeah, he is. <laughs> yeah, Chad. Yeah. Okay. So well, I think Chad's definitely more homage. Yeah. yeah. Talk about his abuelo a good bit, and um, I think the author uh, Tite Kubo he appreciates different cultures a lot and that does lead to appropriation in mm-hmm. some regards it also seems like he picks a language or a group of people to base the villains off of or a group off of i feel i can't say for sure i think one of the filler arcs did something similar but i know the um the villain group um, are the Quincy's who yeah. are very Nazi and well, I'll say German inspired and also heavily Nazi inspired. Yeah. Very. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for making that distinction. Bit. Yeah. <laughs> Cause they're the Stern Ritter, the or Stern Ritter, the star writers, I think. And yeah, instead of all of it's like all the hollow stuff is all um, Spanish named and all of the Quincy stuff is all German named. Hmm. So I think that's this a way for him to design things off of a common. Almost theme. like he wants to categorize <laughs> and generalize. <laughs> I mean, based on reading Bleach, I feel like the thought behind that doesn't go beyond almost like someone just wearing a tattoo, a Chinese tattoo. Yeah. Where he's like, oh, this sounds cool. I'm going to make all these guys that kind of thing. Yeah, probably. Because, yeah, because past the surface level. Who would correct them? Huh? I was just saying who would correct them, but go ahead. Oh, I was saying like past the surface level of like just the names, it doesn't seem like those things are... They, they seem kind of vapid out of the culture itself. Um, mm. uh, ex- well, other than the Quincy's like the, cause like Chad, he's more of an homage and like with his abuela relationship, he actually put pieces of like Latina culture there, but everything else I feel like is at least with the just hollows this, and the run car is just like, he just did it. Just a cool to word. Be cool. Yeah. A cool word. Yeah. I can see that. Not that that's really saving him, but like you said, Daryl, I think he was trying to appreciate, but at certain points, definitely appropriate. <laughs> mm, yeah. It was like it, mixed. It kind of just feels like how, as an anime fan over here, you'll name your profile pick Yami Hikari 32 yeah. or something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It gave me the same vibes as when I read about <laughs> Kubo. And uh, his latest series takes place in London. So we'll see what goes on with that. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And okay. it's called I was just Burn the Witch. And it sounds like I just heard that the Witch Trials mostly took place in um, Europe and not in the US. So. Okay. I guess you could argue the same thing for like other. Like, it's not that different from. Like look at Full Metal Alchemist, which is clearly like a German based people, right? Mm-hmm. Or Attack on Titan, who names like Aaron Jaeger. So um Yeah. I mean the first um Full Metal Alchemist movie movie he gets turns out he get he goes to I think it's pre World War One Germany. Mm. Oh right when it World War One starts. Yeah. Yeah. They had airplanes. They had like the fighter jets at the time. So yeah, and I guess on kind of the, if this kind of feels like the opposite pole of samurai champloo and cowboy bebop, how do you feel about Samurai Jack? Because it is a show made by a Western um, audience, well, Western creative team, where the samurai character is voiced by an African-American person, and um, 
it seems kind of like a big homage to um japanese like samurai films and whatnot oh but, that for sure um yeah they do a lot they, they do, do a lot, lot of series there's a lot to unpack with samurai jack just because i think it it does have so many homages and not just to samurai films, but also to like, you know, different aspects of sci-fi and like freaking like Braveheart with the Scotsman or, um, so I, I feel like it's hard to s- say that's cultural appropriation or maybe you can, if only because it appropriates so much <laughs> mm-hmm. from like all over the world. And I would like to think that was it. Like the creators giving, like Gandhi Tartakovsky gave like homages to like the things that he enjoyed growing up, which like you said, like samurai films. And like if you see his other stuff, like sci fi and giant mon- kaiju movies, right? Or um, in the case of like symbiotic titan, like 80s, like 80s movies, right? Mm-hmm. Like he's, I, it, that might be a case of giving homage, homa- um, homages to so many things that it looks like appropriation just because it all gets mixed together and you kind of like lose sight of where it came from. Uh, I mean, I can see that point, but I feel like the fact that you can clearly see where he's like homaging to um, Mm -hmm. in itself, I think points it shifts it more towards appreciation because um, the credit is clear to like where he's like pulling from even if he's pulling from so many things, like he, he did his work in each thing and you as a viewer understand like where he's pulling from. If that makes sense. Yeah. True. Speaking of Phil, what Daryl, you mentioned the uh, Phil Lamar. What do you think of what he said about how with voice acting, there is no race in his, in his point of view. Hmm. I hadn't heard that quote. So make sure I'm quoting him correctly. (laughs) (laughs) Be careful now. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Let's say he he has a picture of, he has a picture of you. So we we can get back to you. We do have a picture of him. Um, Um, Yeah. I'll say voice acting is a bit touchier. Um, okay. So to clarify, and apparently this is through like different Twitter exchanges. He does recognize that there's a difference between casting to paraphrase casting, like white people as minorities. There's a difference between that and casting minorities as other minorities. And a difference is acting up is the, the difference to him is in terms of, um, hiring opportunities. Yeah, that's that's fair. And so the big thing about voice acting is that you don't have to look exactly like the character or characters you're voicing. Ideally, I think you want the race to be close, at least. Um, I mean, define close. Like if it's <laughs> significant to the character, like to be rooted in their culture, then. I think it would be ideally to have someone who at least can relate to that experience um, so they can bring it out better. Yeah. Sam- huh? Go ahead. I was going to no. say, but in Samurai Jack's case, like he's, he's literally a samurai and you know, probably he is played by a black man, but yeah, I think I'm, I'm not entirely for or against actor. Well, voice actors having to have the exact same, appearance or ethnicity but i do think that well this all kind of came to a head um in the past few years when it was pointed out like oh hey apu is not played by uh i think he's still played by dan calcinetta he was played by dan calcinetta and the whole thing was is it that dan calcinetta i thought that was homer he is but he he's a lot of characters <laughs> yeah he's like, and that's the thing like uh, so many oh, no, uh, Hank Azaria. Hank Azaria. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, when it's like productions like that, where one, like five actors play a hundred characters, mm-hmm. um, it becomes a question of production, like value, right? Or and hiring time and whatnot. It's yeah. still not acceptable, but 
I mean, t- the times has changed where that's not acceptable anymore. Mm-hmm. I would say. Um, as for races playing people of one race playing another different race, I can definitely see the point of the matter of opportunity. And like, <laughs> I really should have thought about this question beforehand. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's like a matter of opportunity yeah. as well as um, representation. Representation. Yeah. Because an example that comes to mind of someone who is cast as not as their race, but isn't seen as problematic because like you said, because of opportunity is uh, Steven Yun, you know, the voice of Mark from invincible. He's also the voice of a blonde white character on troll hunters, hmm. the bully. And who's actually a fascinating character, but he, but that's not really problematic. Cause again, op- like opportunities, right? Like there's, the voice acting industry is super saturated as the American voice act, acting industry anyway, is super saturated with, um, with white people. So yeah, there's yeah. definitely a difference between casting a Korean American as a white kid versus casting a white person as an Asian person. Right. Ideally you'd be high. The actor would be hired based off of their voice. Yeah. The same way as people in any jobs would be hired off of their, ability or opportunity to grow and whatnot true but yeah especially with voice acting i feel like you should have more opportunities for actors of a different race than caucasian being the default but Mm -hmm. their voices should just match the character that they are and if it's a person that whose like delivery and whose background has to they that you might get more of the performance if you if they have a similar background as a character that's mm-hmm. ideal um right. i think of pro zd Sungwon cho um who he has a really good video of like characters who when he's cast as a person for sorry so he has so Sungwon cho has a really good video where he he's like when he's cast as a character for his voice and when he's cast as a character for his appearance and one, he has like a really deep commanding voice and mm-hmm. one is like, hi guys, I'm super nerdy and dorky. So it's, uh, that was good. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty impressive. Yeah. I try, <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, that's to be what's ideal, but as it's not, it's because people are imperfect and have their biases and mm-hmm. can be real. Um, try not to curse. <laughs> yeah. uh, POS is, I think people should give people that are minorities should be given all the opportunities they can to succeed their careers. Yeah. I mean, you see it with like, I, I can only imagine because you see it with live action actors too where someone's name could hurt their chances i'm thinking specifically of like chloe bennett who as people may or may not know is quake from agents of shield and supposedly blossom in the upcoming powerpuff girls uh reboot um but apparently before before she was um auditioning under a name like chloe wong which is her birth name um but the only roles that she was getting was from what's for like you know the token like asian character the nerdy girl the you know so, or the immigrant it wasn't until she started use adapt adopting chloe bennett as a stage name that she actually got more opportunity so i'm wondering for like voice actors hard to say without talking to like a like a casting director mm-hmm. but mm-hmm how much biases come into play when they read like audition sheet and it's like, Oh, this person's name is Wong or Lee. And it's like, Oh, this character is not supposed to have an Asian accent. And it's like, good. Cause I don't have one. Like, <laughs> you know, but a little off topic, but do you guys know Austin Channing Brown? Um, author, public speaker advocate, but sh- I read her book. And she says that she was give. She asked her parents, 
like why she was given the name Austin because that's usually a guy's name. Mm-hmm. And they're like, hey, we want you to okay. not be put in like the reject pile or get get you a second glance when you have your um, resumes out there. So that's so sad. That's yeah. sucks. Mm-hmm. But that's smart. <laughs> that's, <laughs> sucks that that you know her parents you know felt that was necessary. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think you hear that. I I, th- I feel like I've heard that story amongst a lot of, a lot of like Asian. You know, like it's the reason why a lot of Asian people you may know have names that come right out of the Bible, right? Mm. Or right or very mm. American names, or or they're named after like random things that they they encountered while when they first immigrated to America, like they named you after like a street or something like that. Cause they, under the uh, hope that you would have the most American sounding name so you could fit in better. Yeah. Right. Or something I definitely heard that for sure. Except for Brian. I never understand why Brian's so popular. Brian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Brian and Kevin. <laughs> Brian, Kevin. Yeah. I, my parents legit named me after like St. Joseph, like, you know, Jesus' stepfather. So, yeah. like, so I don't know if that was out of, out of like a desire to like, you know, make me sound whiter or more Americanized. Yeah, I mean, I know my parents named me after Sean Connery and Harrison Ford uh, for first and middle name. But usually, when I do apply for casting auditions, I do go by Sean Harrison usually to improve does that, my does that chances. Work? That's um, a great stage name, by the way. Also, I, mean, I did not know that was your middle name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like it's it it's easier to say for sure. And because you know people mess up when like crazy. Um That's true. Yeah. So I do from time to time. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's it's like dual purpose, but yeah, I, I think because it kind of flows better or is more acceptable, I think maybe it it it, it, it would improve my shots i wouldn't know i haven't made it big anywhere yet so <laughs> you know what though i've i played around with the idea of adapting um joe davis as a stage name as well for similar reasons because mm. again avoiding that whole like oh we're not interested in like an asian actor for this role i was like but what if it's a role that like race isn't important you know but yeah i also but i also don't want be, want to be accused of black fishing either by calling myself Joe Davis. Just yeah. I mean, <laughs> most, most of the gigs I feel like I've gotten is because they were specifically looking for Asians. So mm-hmm. I guess my name isn't applicable in that case. <laughs> You're not the right kind of Asian, Sean. We're looking yeah. for Chinese and Japanese. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking of like King of the Hill right now. It's like, oh, yeah. well, when it comes to when it comes to that though, they usually go more based on like your looks. If you're mm-hmm. you can pass because like Simi Liu, he was he was playing um, a Korean guy in uh, that's true. Convenience, and uh, his friend Kimchi is Vietnamese as well. Yeah, like yeah, they were playing Koreans, but I guess they were passing enough that they would fit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not gonna lie, I, I even I don't really know. I don't know any Korean. But hearing kimchi pronounce certain things, I'm like, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> well, I mean, they kind of they kind of worked it well w- with them being like first generation, not having strong Korean in general. That's so true. I think that saved their characters yeah. a lot. They were both very westernized. So uh, all, all the ch- all the kids were westernized compared to their parents, yeah. which was kind of I guess kind of the point. Hmm. Yeah. So. Again, on on the train of like um, you know the other way. What about shows like um, like Avatar or Teen Titans? Like, I know like Avatar is tricky for me because it's like very it's it's based in a very fantasy world, but you could definitely see the Asian influences. Like, I like to think of that as appreciation, right? There, or do you think that's appropriation? <laughs> Daryl, I see you smiling. <laughs> you got some thoughts on this? No, I was just thinking about the Avatar movie. Oh, well, that, 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 you know what? Wasn't obvious when, to M. Night Shyamalan, when but. you were talking about Bleach and how like the creator or the writer was like making every like 
all the villains like either <laughs> Latino or or German. It made me think like M Night Shyamalan. Why did you make the the villains all like your people, man? <laughs> <laughs> I can't. <say. laughs> I mean, Zuko's cool. That's true. But he thought villains are badasses. So he wanted to show. Yeah, he thought that he identified with the like fire South nation. <laughs> the true. Fire. Or he wants to show South Asians as like you know, as the badasses that you know are killing everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness. Uh, Beyond that, we would not speak of the movie no more. <laughs> that movie doesn't exist. Talking about, to clarify, we were talking about a- Avatar, uh, The Last Airbender, and its sequel, The Legend of Korra. <laughs> there is no movie in Bossing Say. There is no movie in Bossing Say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like so. it's appreciation because I feel like the writers really did their homework in terms of like, kind of like, even the character designs and the clothing mm-hmm. to like their city designs, it was very, mm-hmm. very detailed to like, yes, the point where again, it was clear where they were getting and um, their influences from, and they were kind of crediting it mm-hmm. and homaging to where they were getting right. it from. Even down, speaking of details, even down to your fighting styles, right? They yeah. tried to make sure like the bending styles were very unique and tried to make sense of different cultures too because like even like the sun warrior style of firebending their martial arts was more comparable to like pacific islanders versus like you know i guess mainstream like fire nation firebending which is more like uh i think shaolin like a shaolin style so and then like air bendings like copera and even even toff's uh earthbending style is like separated from the others i forgot what like mainstream earthbending is but hers was more based on like hungar which was more like footwork mm. or like strong stances as well as like you know sp- like sweeping your legs which makes sense for a blind girl mm. but so again that extra level of effort and not just naming things because they sound cool yeah although that was mean that they named an airbender otaku if you remember that in Legend of Korra. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <That's dirty one. laughs> yeah, got a little, a little too close to home there. Yeah. <laughs> in terms of Teen Titans, that, that was a nice blend of things. I feel like with uh, their incorporation of the Puffy Amiyumi for their mm-hmm. opening songs, they really like set the vibe for that kind of feel and homage. I think, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, where it felt more appreciative instead of just like they were just straight ripping. Yeah, and so or someone over there definitely just really loved Fully Cooly too because you get, <laughs> you see a lot of references there too. Yeah, like mm-hmm. the like uh, the Gary episode for sure. <laughs> yeah, like I feel like they kind of made it for an audience that they knew also enjoyed anime a lot. So Mm -hmm. it was like kind of like uh, what Daryl was saying in the last episode where the uh, Jujutsu Kaisen, Jujutsu Kaisen's um, author, Magaka, like kind of was a fan of everything himself. And now he's like creating his work and piece for the fans as as a fan himself. And that's Mm -hmm. what Teen Titan kind of feels like for me. Yeah, that's fair. There's definitely no, like, I, I feel like they knew that audiences could tell where they were getting their styles from. I don't yeah. think there's definitely no deception of like, Oh, this is a completely original idea. You know, it's like they, they yeah. were, I think they were betting on people knowing where the roots were from and it paid off. So, yeah, I remember seeing people criticizing it for just being anime inspired and having chibi heads and whatnot. And, uh, but it was funny. <laughs> yeah. But I, I get it. But like to uh, someone who didn't grow up watching anime or anything like that, that's, uh, anathema to them, but yeah. it worked for the target audience. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it did. It's not like the you target um, audiences. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, and that's not like, uh, people come in and, criticize Barney for his lack of complex storylines. But mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Sean. <laughs> oh, that's mine. I was gonna that's say, and, and now and now people are um, wishing that the old series is back because of t- T Titans Go. <laughs> you know, I yeah. used to be in that camp, but I've caught a few episodes. And I'm like, yo, this is just this is just legitimately really funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Teen Titans Go. They're just straight trolling and having fun. Yeah, because <laughs> I, I saw a clip on YouTube. I just stumbled across it. It was like Teen Titans meets Teen Titans Go. <laughs> And like yeah. they eat Young Justice, right? And they're like, "Yo, that's you!" Like, like, yo, I thought you were c- serious, me, but that compared to guy, yeah, you are a joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't that serious. That's the thing. That was the point. Yeah, yeah. like it wasn't afraid to make fun of itself, which was, I think, mm-hmm. really fun about it. Mm-hmm. I think it's the same. Uh, it's the same. Um, Response that I think uh, Batman Brave and the Bold got too, because mm-hmm. that that was definitely also a more lighthearted. It had it definitely had its dark moments and like, but it was also not afraid to make fun of itself as well. And it was also like a homage to you know the you know Adam West Batman, right? Yeah, yeah, and the golden age of superheroes in general. So, um. I think we may have veered past. Yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah. Veering back. Um, so what do y'all think of like, um, lately there's a trend of like, say, um, American produced anime. I'm thinking like Cannon Busters and um, Yasuke, which, uh, which was like a collaboration and definitely like, you know, American produced um, as well as Japanese produce. And then even with like, an, like a slightly older series, like the boondocks, which might not be considered anime, but definitely anime inspired. And with a lot of homages to like, you know, old school, like martial arts films and samurai films. So what do y'all think of that? Like, is that's, is that again, I, I, I probably answered the question already, but is that like more like appreciation than, or where's the line? Like, why is that? Okay. Um, I think it boils down to what Daryl's been saying. Like if they put in the effort and and they show the credit where they got their influences from, everything is pretty clear. Like where they're like paying tribute to, um, and it's cool to see them work with studios and like give opportunities to other people who might not even have it in this span of it of anime. Like they're expanding. Um, even the field of casts of like who, who would even be considered for story writing for um, voice acting and all that stuff. So I think this is where the appreciation is like taking it to the next level um, for me, at least as I see it. Yeah. It doesn't even feel like appreciation anymore. It's more like um, just straight up symbiote. Like what, what do you call that? Like that comp, like symbiosis where it just belongs yeah. kind of yeah like yeah can't even call it appreciation because i i feel like that implies like you are the outside outsider appreciating it. but no. now today's age it's becoming less outsider and more like you are part of this now yeah you yeah. know which is cool no i agree i agree obviously there's a lot to unpack with this topic so we will be taking a break for this. So this has been part one to the next week for part two about our discussion on cultural appropriation. Thanks for tuning in to Geeks Represent. If you've enjoyed this discussion, subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and everywhere podcasts can be found. If you want to add to this discussion, visit geeksrepresent.com. There you can find our social media links. Thanks for listening. <laughs>